Hello guys and welcome back to the second part of this lesson three in which we are looking at increasing and decreasing functions which is all about the monotonicity of a function and we equally look at other aspects of functions with regard to turning points and how to distinguish between those turning points those are some of the key points we're going to see in this lesson and there are a lot more please make sure you watch this lesson to the end and don't forget to leave your comments below and to subscribe and click on the notifications. You can join us for the preparatory classes every Sunday, which is live and online at exactly 8 p.m. GMT plus one. You can equally join our online classes by going to the address www.gcematpanel.blogspot.com where you will have complete information on the class. So each day you want to attend class online, you can go to www.gcematpanel.blogspot.com and you will have information about class. So looking at increasing and decreasing functions, a function is said to be increasing when the gradient of that function is positive. So when the y dx is strictly greater than zero, we say the function is increasing. On the other hand, if the y dx is less than negative or is uh, less than zero, then we say the function is decreasing. Normally, at a stationary point, dy dx is equal to zero. So that's the idea we're going to have here. So the gradient function at the stationary point is equal to zero. Because at the stationary point, the function is neither increasing nor decreasing. And with the stationary point, it can be a maximum turning point, a minimum turning point, or a point of inflection. We are going to see all of that in this lesson. So make sure you watch this lesson to the end. So first, a function is increasing if its gradient is positive, Secondly, the function is decreasing if the gradient is negative. And thirdly, if the gradient is equal to zero, then that point is a stationary point. So let's look at this example. Given the function f of x is equal to that, determine whether this function is increasing or decreasing at x equals three. So the first thing we'll have to do is to look for the gradient function. And that is dy dx or y prime, right? So from here, our y prime, will be given by um, dy dx. So we look for y prime. So y prime or dy dx will be equal to, when we differentiate uh, x to the power three, you have three x to the power two. When we differentiate minus six x squared, you have minus 12 x. And when you differentiate the constant two, the result is zero, okay? So this is y prime. Now, we cannot tell whether this gradient function y prime is increasing or decreasing, but since they want us to get the value at x equals 3, so we'll look for y prime of 3. If y prime of 3 fulfills any of these conditions, then we know how we can conclude. So y prime of 3 will be equal to 3 into 3 squared, 3 squared minus 12 times 3, right? Minus 12 into 3. So uh, three into three squared will be equal to 27. 27 and minus 36. What's that going to give us? It's going to give us negative nine. Negative nine. Now this number, is this number greater than zero, less than zero or equal to zero? So this negative nine is a negative number. So it's less than zero at the point where x equals three. Therefore, we conclude that this function is decreasing at x equals three. So that's the conclusion we are going to give. So thus, f is decreasing at x equal to three. So this is the conclusion. f is decreasing at x equals three. Let us take um, the second example. Let's take another example. Now we have given the function y equals x over x minus one. We have to determine whether this function is increasing or decreasing. Here they have not given us any value. So we have to look for the various intervals for which is increasing, the interval for which is decreasing. So from here, our y prime, or that is uh, the derivative or the gradient function. Since this uh, function is a quotient, we are going to use the quotient rule. So we keep the bottom constant minus one, we differentiate the top. When we differentiate the top, we are going to have uh, one, right? So all of this times one minus the top now constant. The top is X. When we differentiate the bottom, we are going to have one. 
all this on the bottom squared, right? This is the quotient rule. So on the bottom squared, we have x minus one, all of this squared, squared all of this. So when we simplify this function, the numerator is we are going to be left with minus one, all over the denominator x minus one squared, x minus one squared. This function is a very good example of a function because if you look at the numerator in this function, it's always negative. So the numerator in this gradient function is always negative because negative one is a negative number. But for the denominator, x minus one all squared because of that all squared, the denominator is always positive no matter the value of x. So therefore this function is always positive with respect to the numerator that's the gradient. I'm sorry, it's always negative. The numerator is always negative. Why the denominator is always positive. So positive divided by negative is equal to negative, right? So this function, the gradient is always less than zero. So y prime is strictly less than zero for this particular function. So what do we conclude? We conclude that the function y is decreasing. So what do we conclude? Y is decreasing. Y is decreasing. So some sense to write strictly decreasing, that's okay. Why is strictly decreasing? No problem. And let's look at the third example. The third example, we have um, the function. Find the interval for which this function is increasing and the interval for which the function is decreasing. So here they want us to get the various intervals. Let's start by looking for the gradient function y prime. So y prime will be equal to two x, we differentiate x squared, we are going to have two x minus, when differentiate x, we have one, differentiate the constant, we have zero. So now this is the gradient function and there are three things the gradient function. Either it is increasing, it is zero, that is this constant, or it is negative. So the first thing we have to do is to equate this gradient function to zero. So we have two x minus one equals zero. Know that the value is equal to zero when what happens at the turning point. So we first of all look for the value of x at the turning point. So we have two x minus one equals zero. And from here, what does it imply? It implies that x is equal to what? X is equal to a half. X is equal to one on two. Now we already know that when x is equal to one on two, this gradient function is zero because you have equated to zero and so on. Now, what happens to this gradient function when x is less than, when x is less than a half? So we want to know that when x is less than a half, the, the gradient function is positive or negative. That is increasing or decreasing, right? So we are going to look for y prime, that is the gradient function, at the point where x is less than this value that we have solved for. Less than this value that we have solved for, x is, less than a half, that is before this value, what happens to the function immediately before this value? Is it positive or negative? That's what we are interested in, we are interested in the sign. So take any number less than a half and put in this gradient function and test. So put it in this gradient function. You have two times zero is zero minus one minus one, so it's negative. So for any value of x less than a half, this gradient function is negative or the function is decreasing. So for this interval, it is decreasing. Now let's look for y prime at x strictly greater than two now. What happens to the function after x equals two? So strictly greater than a half, I'm sorry, uh, after uh, a half, not two. Take any number greater than a half. For example, we can take a one and test in this gradient function here. We will have two times one, which is two, two minus one, one, one is positive, right? So this is what happens to this function. So even from this question, you can have an idea about the turning point for this particular curve, if you have to do curve sketching. Because this is what happens, uh, at values of x less than a half, which you have solved for down here, the function is decreasing, right? So from a half, from below, the function is decreasing, as you can see. And at this point where we have a half, what happens to the function? It is zero, right? At x is equal to a half, the function is zero. And above x is equal to a half, the function is positive, it's increasing. So this gives us an idea about the nature of the turning point. Because this is a minimum turning point. 
So this is a minimum turning point. So we can do our conclusions here, right? So for this particular function, for this interval at x equal to, at x strictly less than a half, what happens? The function y is decreasing. So it's decreasing at x less than a half, this function is decreasing. Now what happens at x equals zero? At x equals zero, what would be the value of y when x equals zero? At x equals zero, what happens to the function? We have a turning point, right? It's stationary. Stationary. And at x greater than a half, at x strictly greater than a half now, what happens to the function? Y is increasing. So from here, you can even tell, uh, you can talk about the nature of the turning points as you can see. This is a minimum turning points. So when you say you should distinguish between, or if you state the nature of the turning points, this is what they mean. They want you to tell them if the, the, the turning point or the stationary point is a minimum uh, turning point, a maximum turning point, or a point of inflection. Now, um, for a minimum or a maximum turning point, the gradient will change from negative through positive or from positive through negative. That means the sign will change. But for a point of inflection, the gradient before, if it's negative after, it will still be negative. So we change from zero, from negative through zero to negative, or from positive through zero to positive. That is the behavior of point of inflection. So for maximum or turning point or minimum turning point, the sign of the gradient function will change. But for point of inflection, the sign before and after will remain the same. Okay. Good. Now let us take um, the next example. You don't, if you don't understand this, you can rewind the video and play it again. Uh, let's take the next example so that we don't waste much time. Find the interval for which lean one minus x is increasing, and then the interval for which it is decreasing. So this is actually a logarithmic function. Uh, y prime here will be equal to. How do we differentiate the logarithmic function? It is equal to the derivative of the core. The core means the the values, that is that uh, expression immediately after lean. That one is the core or the inside function. So when you differentiate this inside function, one minus x, you have negative one. All over the, uh, the core function itself, or one minus x. Okay. So this from this uh, the gradient function like this, be very careful. So you cannot conclude that this function is increasing or decreasing because from the numerator, you may be tempted to say that this function is strictly decreasing because the numerator is negative. No. The denominator is not positive, nor is it negative. So the, the values of the denominator or the sign varies with respect to the value of x. So in this particular case, since it is the denominator that determines if the function is increasing or decreasing, what we are going to do is we are going to equate this denominator to zero. One minus x equals zero. Know that when x is equal to one, uh, this uh, gradient function is undefined. Is equal to zero. And then from here, x will be equal to what value? And that gives us x to be equal to one. Note that from the domain of definition of the lean, this lean one minus x, the point x equals one is a vertical asymptote. So the function is not defined at this point x equals one, okay? So we are not going to include this in our discussion. If you look at this lean function, I repeat again, one minus x, the domain is a set of all real numbers such that one minus x is strictly greater than zero. One minus x is strictly greater than zero because link zero is not defined now. I want to show you about the domain. But with the issues of domain, you can go back to the previous lesson, I think lesson six, and you see the domain of functions. So from here, x is what? Um, strictly less than what? Strictly less than one. Note that when you divide both sides by negative sign, the sign of the inequality changes. And this value of x equals one is a vertical asymptote. So from here, what happens to this function at, that is y, this gradient function, y prime at x less than, strictly less than one. What happens to this for the gradient function? Strictly less than one. 
what will be the gradient of this curve, especially less than one. So we can take um, another value. Let's see if we take zero, what happens? This will give us lin one minus zero, right? Um, I think one not very good because it's going to give us lin zero. If you can already see that zero is positive or negative. So let's take um, n number less than one. Let's take 0 0.5. So we'll have the numerator here will be negative. The denominator one minus 0 0.5 is positive, right? So this is going to give us a negative value. So this is equal to negative. So for x less than one, the function is decreasing. But now, since this, the domain of this function, the domain of this function is x strictly less than one, right? Can you see x strictly less than one? So we cannot be looking for x greater than one. Because if x is greater than one, this function is undefined. So we cannot talk about an interval there when the function is undefined at x greater than one. So normally, this function is strictly decreasing. This function is strictly decreasing. So we can conclude that y is strictly decreasing. As I have said, if you look at the domain of this function, you have the domain is a set of all real numbers such that x is less than one. That's the domain of the function, x is less than one. So this is the domain from negative infinity to one. Negative infinity to one. So this is the domain of y. So we have already taken the number less than one, right? We cannot take any other number again to test in this uh, particular uh, function, okay? All right. So um, this gives us the domain to be called to that. Therefore, this function is, what is the conclusion? Y is strictly decreasing, strictly decreasing. Okay. Or well, maybe you can try to see how you can sketch this function online and you still see that it's strictly decreasing. Let's look at the next. Determine the monotonicity of this function. Note that monotonicity means whether the function is increasing or decreasing, right? So you should determine all of that. So we start by looking for y prime with this function and y prime will be equal to when you differentiate x, you have one. You differentiate in x, you have plus, in x is the derivative of the core, which is one over the core function. So when we bring like terms together here, we are going to have x plus one plus one, all this over what? x. So first of all, uh, determine the stationary points. Stationary points where y prime is zero. So when we equate this to zero, we have um, x plus one to be equal to zero. And x is equal to negative one. Negative one. So this point where x is equal to negative one gives us an idea about um, this function. Hmm? Gives us an idea about this function. So, but now let us, when we look at this function, what is the domain of this function? The domain of this function y is normally the domain of this function is made up of two functions, the x part, the domain of this x is a set of all real numbers. Now plus this second function, which is lin x. The domain of this second function is a set of all real numbers such that x is greater than one. So it's a set of all real numbers from, I'm sorry, strictly greater than zero, from zero to positive, infinity from zero to positive infinity. All right, because if you take any number that is a uh, negative, this lean part of the function will not be defined. This lean part of the function will not be defined. And equally with this function, we know that um, the line x equals zero is a vertical asymptote. It's a vertical asymptote. And since this line is a vertical asymptote, it means that below this line, 
below the value of x equals zero, this curve does not exist on this other side. Know that the line x equals zero is the y-axis. So the curve does not exist on the left-hand side of the y-axis. And it therefore means that on this side where we have x to be equal to negative one, there is no possibility of us having this curve existing here. Okay. So I can, let me show you this curve online so you see exactly what I am talking about. All right, um, we'll go to the GC image panel. All right, GCE math panel classes online. You can get the and use our calculator and you see how this curve would do like. So let me just get the cal to the calculator and see what it gives us calculators. So this calculator, we look at them a curve sketcher or plotter. And that our curve is X plus lean X, right? X plus lean X. So this is the curve x plus lean x. Can you see how the curve looks like? Exactly as we were saying. The smallest value of this curve is a bit above zero. So x is not equal to zero. So you can actually see that that point was showing as if it's a turning point. So it is very important that before you work with some of these um, monotonicity of functions, you should first of all know the domain for which the function is defined. Because you said that's, that was not the turning point. Where x is equal to negative one, the curve does not even exist. Are we together? So let's go back now and then we see exactly um, what we are actually explaining. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, get another board. Mm -hmm. All right. So as we have seen for the domain of this function, you have seen that um, our y prime was equal to x plus one over what? Over x. We equally saw that the domain of this function was equal to the set of all real numbers, positive real numbers, that's zero from above to positive infinity. Therefore, at that point, we did not really have um, does not really have a turning point. That was actually not the turning point as we saw. And so from here, I'm just working with y prime at x greater than zero. Because that value of x, which is negative one, does not exist in this do domain of definition. It's not in this interval. So we don't consider it. So we just consider only the value of x at y prime at x greater than zero. And from that curve, we have seen that if x is strictly greater than zero, this value also be greater than zero. We be positive, right? So we can now see that this function is strictly increasing. This point, these concepts are very important when you get to curve sketching. So y is strictly increasing. Y is strictly increasing. Be very, very, very careful with this particular topic. It's very important. So that's the only thing you know about y. Y is strictly increasing. Okay. All right, now let's take the next. So the next thing we'll be discussing at now is uh, looking at is second order derivative. We have already seen first order derivative, that is y prime. Now let's look at y prime prime or d squared y dx squared or f prime prime. The second order derivative is very also very important when you want to determine the nature of the turning point. You want to determine if that turning point is a maximum or a minimum turning point. Secondly, the second order derivative is very, very important in mechanics when we are working with, um, uh, that is math and physics mechanics. Maybe they are giving you the displacement of a particle at a particular time, and you want to look for the acceleration of that particle. You have to differentiate y two times, because when you differentiate the first time, you have velocity. You differentiate again, you have acceleration. So when we do this, it's very important in that. And equally, maybe in integration, when you are now given the acceleration of the particle and they ask you to look for the displacement of that particle, you have to integrate and integrate again. So that is the importance of the second order derivative. It's also very important to other economics concepts where you have to determine if 
uh, a point in margin, uh, I don't know, marginal utility, or when you're working with a population, optimum population or all of that, I've given you the equation of that, and you have to determine whether it is the maximum optimum population or the minimum population. So it's also very important in population studies and other economics uh, concepts for those who are doing A4, economics advanced level. Let's, let's look at the second order derivative. So differentiating a curve, y equals f of f gives us the derivative dy dx or f prime or y prime, right? When you differentiate the second time, we are going to have d squared. For the numerator, the square comes before the y. For the denominator, the square comes after. So you have d squared y on dx squared or f prime prime of x, or we can have y prime prime. So you can equally use a y prime prime. So we have, here we have y prime for the first derivative and the second derivative we have y prime prime as the second derivative. So this second order derivative gives us the rate of change of the gradient function. So the second derivative is just the same like the gradient of the gradient, the gradient of the gradient. And we can equally get the second order derivative whether with parametric differentiation or whatever. So the second order derivative can be used to decide whether the stationary point is maximum or minimum or stationary. Maybe call it the point of inflection. Okay. Well, let's take some examples. So we have this um, function given by y is equal to that find y prime and y prime prime. So the first order derivative here will be equal to 3x squared minus 12x minus what, guys? Minus 15. So this is the first order derivative, right? Now we can get the second order derivative, y prime prime, or the squared y dx squared. And that will be equal to 6x. When you differentiate again, you have 6x minus 12. And that is all for the second order derivative, y prime prime, which is written as the squared y on the x squared, as well as f prime prime. Um, the next example, you have x, y equals seven five dy dx and the squared y dx squared. Now this curve has been given in parametric form. So we can define, we can make it to be explicit, uh, explicit. I'm sorry, in implicit form, we can make it to be explicit and differentiate, or we can work with it directly like this. So another thing to start by saying that y is equal to seven over x, and the person will use the quotient rule. Another may just use implicit differentiation directly. Whatever method you use, we are going to end up with the same answer. So we just use one method. I'll apply the product rule here. So we have x constant. We differentiate y, we are going to have y prime plus, we now keep y constant and we differentiate x, we'll have one. When we differentiate seven, we are going to have zero. So from here, we can make y prime the subject of the formula because our y prime is the y dx. So y prime will be equal to minus y over x. So this is our y prime, right? And normally it will not be good to also leave the y in the answer like this at the end. Sometimes I should leave your answer in terms of x. So I can replace this y here by what? From this question, we know that y is equal to seven on x. So I'll have negative seven on x, that is y, divided by x. And what is this going to give us? This is going to give us negative seven on x squared. So this is our y prime, right? But now the question wants us to find dy dx. So how do we get uh, the second derivative now? This was the a part. Now the b part, we have to look for um, y prime prime or the squared y dx squared, right? So um, when we differentiate this now, we can just use this first one and differentiate. So when we differentiate y prime, because this is y prime, when we differentiate this, we are going to have, differentiate the left hand side, you have y prime prime. Hmm? Because this is y prime is equal to that. So when you differentiate y prime, we are going to have y prime prime. So we are through the left hand side. Now the right hand side, 
this is a quotient. So we apply the quotient rule. We keep the bottom constant. It's x squared, when you differentiate the top, you are going to have zero. So no need for me to be writing all of that. So I'll just put zero. Now minus the top constant, minus, minus seven, because the top is minus. Minus top constant, you differentiate the bottom. You have two x. All that on the bottom squared. People like to see all that over the bottom squared. I don't know, but we did not teach that. So this gives us all this over x to the power two, all raised to the power two. So we have x, x squared, all raised to the power two. So uh, this will give us 14x. All that over x to the power four. So we can just write the answer as 14 over x to the power three, okay? So we have 14 x over x to the power four, which is equal to 14 over x to the power three. So this is the second order derivative of y. This is the second order derivative of y. So take note. All right, the next example. Um, okay, the next example we have discussing about the second order derivative in terms of parameter uh, metrized curve, we can find the second order derivative as follows. So uh, for the second order derivative, when we have parametric functions or a para curve given in parametric form, where we already have the first order derivative, as you can see here, we already have the first order derivative, which is y prime. We are now going to differentiate that y prime with respect to x. But since you're working with par the parameter t, for example, then that curve was given in terms of the parameter t, x is a function of t and y is a function of t, then we can get the second order derivative by differentiating y prime. We differentiate y prime with respect to t and divide by the derivative of x with respect to t. And this will give us the squared y over dx squared. But if it is possible that we can convert that curve to Cartesian form and then we actually do the differentiation, then that will still be okay. Please, guys, after you watch this video, make sure that you watch lesson 8D. 8D is the tutorial on differentiation. It covers all the lessons in chapter 8. It covers uh, lesson 8A, lesson 8B, lesson 8C, and lesson 8, uh, there's a small part in lesson 8D. It covers all of that. Please make sure you watch this tutorial and, and see all the questions that we have answered online. Okay? So this tutorial should be looked into. To look for the tutorial, just go to 8D. That's where the tutorial is, 8D. All right, let's take an example. So before we take the example, if you are given the curve in parametric form, then the first thing to do is to find dy dx. Hmm? But you cannot look for dy dx. So if that term is in function of another function, let me say t, then this is what we are going to do. We are going to find the first derivative of y with respect to t. They find the first derivative of y with respect to, of x now with respect to t. Then we find dy dx by dividing dy t over dy dx. Okay. So this one here is not well explained. It's not well explained. Uh, the steps are what I've just mentioned. This is not well explained because normally uh, this is supposed to be, I'm sorry, this were, these were typing errors. So this first one you are going to look for, you look for dy on the t. Then after looking for dy dt, we differentiate this, right? All right, now the second one, we look for dx dt. Look for dx dt. Then we obtain dy dx. This is what we are going to use now. We have dy dx. Now the next step is to differentiate 
dy dx, which is y prime, with respect to dx, or this is the summary here on the right hand side. In fact, let us just take an example and explain this better. Okay. So find the squared y over dx squared in this function that is given. So let's find the y dx in this function. So the first thing we'll have to do is to look for dx dt. And the x on the t will be equal to one minus two t. We now look for dy dt. And dy dt will be equal to one also minus three t what? t squared. Now, what will be dy dx? Because we first of all need dy dx. That's what I was explaining before. Or well, dy dx will be equal to dy dt divided by dx dt. So it's dy dt first, the y is on top. So we have one minus three t squared. All this on what? dx dt, one minus two t. So from here, we already have our dy dx. So now how do we get um, y prime prime, that is the squared y dx squared. So from this point, what we are going to do is, according to the formula, we are now going to look for dy, as we differentiate this now with respect to t, we differentiate this with respect to t, so we look for the derivative of one minus three t squared. All this were one minus two t. And this, fun this function, what's this function? This is the y, the x, y, which is the y prime. So this is the y, the x, which is y prime. So we differentiate this one with respect to the what? dx, right? And this is the same as the derivative of this function, dt, all this divided by dx dt. So this is where that formula comes from. But we already have dx dt. Now we have to work with the numerator. So when we differentiate this numerator with respect to t, um, we are going to have bottom constant, one minus two t. We differentiate the top. What are we going to have? We want to differentiate the top. You are going to have minus six t, right? So bottom constant. We differentiate the top. We, have, we differentiate the top. We are going to have minus six t minus top constant. Always remember to use brackets in this type of functions where you have sums or differences. So minus now the top constant differentiate the bottom. You are going to have minus two, right? So I can just put plus two here. All this on the bottom squared. So one minus two t, two t, all what? All squared. So this is for the numerator. Now we divide all of this answer by the dx dt. What is the x dt? The x dt is one minus two t. So what would be our final answer? Yeah, our final answer here will be equal to, so when we simplify the numerator, we're going to have minus six times minus two t. That's going to give us 12 t times t, 12 t squared. So 12 t squared minus 6 t squared, that gives us 6 t squared. Now minus six times one is minus six times t, so minus six t, minus six t plus two, plus two, you can simplify this, right? 
all this on. Now note that one minus two t all squared divided by one minus two t is the same as one minus two t all cube. Hmm? When you have a fraction divided by a number, is the same as multiplying numerator and denominator by the reciprocal of that denominator of that number. So cube. So this is what we have as our final answer. So take note of this. So the first thing is to get your look for dy dx. Uh, sorry, dx dt. Then look for dy dt. Divide dy dt by dx dt. You have dy dx. This dy dx that you now have like this, you are going to differentiate it, and the answer that you have. You divide that answer by dx dt. So you differentiate this one with respect to t, and the answer you have divide by dx dt. I, I think I like this one so much. This was a tough one. And <laughs> so first we look for dy dt, we look for dx dt, then we look for dy dx. We now differentiate dy dx with respect to a t. So the dy dx on the t divided by dt dx dt, and we simplify the results. We are sorry that these particular videos are a bit longer because students find a lot of difficulties. So that's why we make it a bit longer. We have to take more time to explain. For the other simpler ones, like the next topic, which is on curve sketching, is going to be very simple. That's a chapter nine, curve sketching. Okay. Uh, given that x is equal to this and y is equal to that, find y prime and y prime prime. Okay, so this one is this one is an easy one. It looks uh, difficult. So we look for uh, let me let me start with dy. Dy the theta. Dy the theta will be equal to minus two cos theta and the x d theta what will be the x d theta the x d theta will be equal to minus two sine theta so from here what will be the y dx the y dx will be equal to uh, dy d theta divided by dx d theta. That will just give us minus two uh, cos theta divided by minus two sine theta. So finally, our result will just be equal to this minus two to cancel out. We'll be left with my, uh, cos theta on sine theta, which is equal to cot theta, cot theta. Cot theta is the same as one over cos theta. So that's what we have. And from here we can look for y prime prime. We can look for y prime prime, right? Now y prime prime will be equal to, now we are going to differentiate this one, this dy dx with respect to theta. So let me just do it that way, so that is clear. The next step now we look for the y prime the theta. The y prime the theta. Our y prime is dy the x. So we differentiate with respect to theta, we are going to have when you differentiate cot theta, cot theta is same as cos theta on sine theta. So we can use that idea. We keep the bottom constant. We have sine theta. We differentiate the top, we have minus cos theta, that is, uh, sorry, minus sine theta. You can put the minus in front. Now, minus the top constant, minus cos theta. Differentiate the bottom, you have cos theta. All this on the bottom squared. This is going to give us, dividing this by the bottom squared, we are going to have sine squared theta. But for this numerator, we can factor it out because this one is my sine squared theta. We can factor it the negative sign, you leave it outside. As you can see, this is a negative sign. 
And this is going to give us sine squared theta plus cos squared theta, all of these equal to one. So we'll have minus one on sine squared theta. So this one is the same as negative cos x squared theta. Therefore, we can get our y prime prime. What will be y prime prime now? Y prime prime will be equal to the y prime the theta on the x the theta. So the y prime the theta, so we have minus one on sine squared theta. Divided by what? Divided by the x the theta. What's the x the theta? Minus two sine theta, right? So our final answer will just be equal to one over two sine cube theta. Sine cube theta. Wow, this one too was really a good one. Hmm? Very good, very nice. All right, let us take the next one, which is going to be our assignment. Take some as our assignment. It's easy. So we find y prime and y prime prime in this one. It's like this an assignment. You can leave your answer in the link below. Assignments. Now let's look at stationary points. I think this is where we'll come to the end of this lesson. Stationary points. So, like we explained before, a stationary point can be a maximum turning point or a minimum turning point or a point of inflection. So this can be a maximum turning point, a minimum turning point, or a point of inflection. So for example, if you look at this curve here, the stationary point of course when the gradient of the curve is zero, and this can be a maximum point or a minimum point. And if you look at the maximum turning point, so the gradient changes from positive through zero to negative here. You can see like a hill now, you climb a hill, you're climbing, so it's increasing. You get to the maximum point on the hill and you start descending. So that's a maximum turning point. And these other points here is a minimum turning point. The gradient changes from negative through zero to positive. So that type of behavior is the minimum turning points. And that is the idea you're going to use for this maximum and minimum turning points. All right, so a maximum turning point or a minimum turning point are all stationary points. But for the maximum turning point, the gradient will change from positive through zero to negative. For the minimum turning point, the gradient will change from negative through zero to positive. For a point of inflection, the gradient will change from, will not change. It will move from zero, from negative through zero to negative, or it will move from positive through zero to positive. So the difference between a point of inflection and a maxima or minima is that for the point of inflection, the gradients before the turning points and after is the same, positive, positive, or from negative to negative. So when you are to find the coordinates of the stationary point, you start by solving the equation dy dx is equal to zero. Let's take an example. Given the curve of the equation this, find the stationary point and decide on the nature of the stationary point. Deciding on the nature means you should tell us if it's a maximum or a minimum or a point of inflection. So here I will start by solving the equation y prime equals zero. Mm -hmm. So y prime here will be equal to three x squared minus 12. We now equate this to zero. So we have three x squared minus 12 equals zero, because we have to solve this equation. And I don't waste time to solve the equation. When you solve this equation, you have two values of x. You have x equals two, or x equals minus two. So you have two values of x. So from here, 
x equals 2 is not a point, and x equals negative 2 is not a point. So we want to find the corresponding values when x equals 2. What is the value of y? So when you substitute 2 into this given equation, you have 2 to the power 3, which is 8, minus 24 is minus 16, plus 7. You have minus 9. So when x is equal to 2, let me call, for stationary points, I always like to use x and y. So let x be the first point, it coordinates when x is 2, y is equal to minus 9. Okay. Now the second stationary point is when y is equal to negative 2. So when y is equal to negative 2, we substitute in this given equation. We have uh, negative 2 to the power 3 is negative 8 plus 24 that's plus 16, 16 plus 9, 16 plus 7 rather. What is 16 plus 7? 23. So we have this 23. So we can now distinguish between this, which of them is the maximum, which one is the minimum, once to determine the nature. So we look for y prime at x less than 2. We are working with the, the x, right? We want to see the sign. So if x is less than 2, let's take 0 and fit inside here. You start, this gradient is going to be negative. And for y prime above 2, x greater than 2, Take a number greater than 2, for example, 3. We fit 3 here, we'll have a positive value. Positive value. So you can see that this gradient changes from before 2, it is negative, going down. And after 2, or at 2, it is 0. And after 2, it is positive. So what our turning point is this? It's a minimum turning point. So in general, when the gradient changes from negative through zero to positive, then that is what type of turning point? A minimum. So x2 minus 9 is a mini. It's a minimum turning point. Okay. Now let's take the second point y. It could minus 2 and 23. So we start by looking for the gradient before negative 2. So y prime at the value of x less than negative 2. Negative 2. Which number? Can I, let's take negative 3, right? You put negative 3 here, we have negative 3 squared is plus 9 times 3, 27. So this one is going to be positive. And y prime, y prime at x greater than negative 2. You can take negative 1, right? If you fit negative 1 here, this value is going to be negative. So you can see that this uh, curve changes from positive. I'm sorry. It increases. That is positive. At 0, at a minus 2, it is 0. And then it decreases after negative 2. So what type of turning point is this? Yes, so this is therefore a maximum turning point. So y, it coordinates what? Minus 2, 23 is a maximum, t maximum TP, it's a maximum turning point. So that's how we distinguish the, uh, between the, uh, the turning points. If you are using the first derivative test, this one is the first derivative test, that is y prime, right? So it's the first derivative test, this is how we distinguish between the two points. Then we have this, let's take another example. Right, number two, we have x over x minus one. You want to find the stationary points and determine, distinguish between them. So here y prime, we already had the value before, right? bottom constant, differentiate top. So we had minus one, when we differentiate it, so I'm not differentiating again, over x minus one all squared. 
So there is no x in the numerator of this function. There is no x in the numerator of this function. So here there is no TP, okay? Because we have when is the function is a quotient, you get the turning points by equating the numerator to zero. Okay. So no turning points, no TP. There is no turning points. And we can look at this curve now. We can equally look at this curve on a graph. If you look at the graph, you can see this curve then. You can see this curve. Let us look at this curve, x over x minus one. So if you have x over, that's x over x minus one, Can you see how this curve looks like? So this curve does not have any turning points. Okay? That's the curve. It has no turning points. If you maximize it, that's how the curve looks like. And there is no turning points in this curve. This okay. So that it just confirms now what we just said about the turning points that the curve has no turning points. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no turning points here. The next one is this one, e to the power two x minus that. So y prime here will be equal to two e to the power two x, when you differentiate that, minus two e to the power x. When you equate this to zero, we will have um, two e to the power x into e to the power x minus one is equal to zero. But we know that this e to the power x can never be equal to zero, right? So we just work with um, e to the power x minus one equals zero. And from here, what will be the value of x? Mm -hmm. For those who do not attend my first class, uh, you can see this there. One is the same as e to the power zero. So from here, since the bases are the same, we can now equate the powers and x will be equal to zero. So when x is equal to zero, what will be the value of y? y of zero will be equal to you substitute a zero into this given equation. You have um, one minus two minus three. So y of zero will be equal to minus four. So let us call this turning point x with coordinates x is equal to zero and y is equal to minus four. Now we have to see what type of turning points it is, whether a maxi or a mini. So y prime of x at x less than zero. If you take any no negative number and fit here, this function is going to give us a negative value. And y prime at x greater than zero, greater than zero. If you take a number, for example, one, e squared, e squared is about nine, right? Minus, right. So, okay, let us see if you have, um, for example, one, um, e squared is equal to, that's 2.71 squared, which is going to give us about nine, uh, minus three, that's about six. Uh, minus this one is still going to give us a positive number, okay? So we can start this, this turning point here is like this. So it's a mini, right? It's a mini turning point. All right, you can equally check all of this on your calculators. So this gives us a minimum um, turning point just by looking at the curve here. The equation of x squared, the quadratic 
is positive. So you, you are obviously expecting a minimum turning point. All right, the next thing here. So we can equally use the second order, uh, the second derivative test to, test to decide whether a stationary point is maximum or minimum. So we can just use the second order to decide. In those decisions there, if the gradient did not change or change from positive through zero to positive, now we know there's a point of inflection. So the second order derivative is used and in using it, if the squared y on the x squared is negative, then we have a maximum turning point. If the, y, the squared y on the x squared is positive, we have a minimum turning point. But if the value is equal to zero, then this point could be a maximum, a minimum, or a point of inflection. So if the value is equal to zero and then the second test fails, you must go back and use the first test to decide on the nature of the turning point. Example, you have y is equal to that, find the stationary point and its nature. So from here, you can get the stationary points directly, right? When you solve this one, you can get the stationary points very fast. So uh, we have y prime is equal to 2x minus 4. And if you equate this to 0 and solve, and that will imply that x is equal to 2. x is equal to 2. And when x is equal to 2, y will be equal to 2 squared 4 um, plus 3, 7 minus that minus 1. So let me call this turning point x, it coordinates minus 1. Ah, sorry, 2 minus 1. Thank you for the correction. 2 minus 1. So these are turning points. They want us to use the second order derivative test to determine whether this turning point is maximum or minimum. So I'll just look for y prime prime y prime prime will be equal to two. And this is greater than zero, right? Since it's greater than zero, and then we conclude that whenever the y prime prime is greater than zero, then we have a mini instead. When it is bigger than zero, we still have a mini. Minimum turning point. So this is a second order derivative test. All right. Um, so the next thing here that we are going to have, let's look at the next uh, we have. So we have this other one to find the stationary points and use the second derivative test to determine the nature of that second derivative. So y prime from here will be equal to, we keep x constant, differentiate e to the x, you have e to the x, plus you keep it the s constant and differentiate x, you're going to have one, right? So when we equate this to zero, we will have, let me just factorize this, we'll have e to the power x into x plus one to be equal to zero. Normally e to the power x cannot never be equal to zero. So we consider only x plus one equals zero. So from there, x will be equal to negative one. When x is negative one, what will be y of negative one? So we substitute negative one into the given function. You have negative e to the power negative one, right? And this can also be written as negative one over e. So therefore means you have the stationary points, let me call the stationary points y, that's when x is equal to negative one and y is equal to minus one on e. So we have a turning point here. So we want us to use second derivative test to determine whether this point is maximum, minimum, or what. So we have to differentiate, we have to look for y prime prime. So y prime prime will be equal to, so we are going to differentiate this one again. That we get, is going to give us, x constant differentiate e to the x plus e to the x constant differentiate x plus e to the x, right? 
So what is this going to give us? This is going to give us x plus two of this e to the x. So this is what it gives us. So now with this value of y prime prime, you know that e to the power x is always positive and x plus two, x plus two is always um, positive if x is greater than negative two. But it will be negative if x is less than that, okay? So from here, I cannot conclude exactly that this y prime prime is positive or negative. So it is clear that you cannot use the second derivative test here to conclude. Though you can still proceed with it, but I advise that you use, in cases like this, you go back and use the first derivative test. And if you use the first derivative test, you find the function decreasing before x equals negative one, and after it be increasing. And you find out this point is a minimum turning point. So it's a mini. Right, so we are rounding up already. All right, so you can take this one as an assignment. This one is a very simple one. Yes, this one you can use a second derivative test and everything will be okay. From here, you can see the point is uh, a minimum turning point. It's just one turning point. Mm -hmm. It's a minimum turning point and there is just one turning point. So this is an assignment to do it and leave in the link below. Um, tangents and normals. Tangent and normal. So the relationship between uh, a tangent and a normal with respect to their gradient is that the gradient of a normal to a curve is minus one times the uh, times minus one divided by the gradient of the tangent. So if you have the gradient of the tangent and you take minus one on that gradient, you're going to have the gradient of the normal. And this is a relationship here drawn by these curves. A tangent is a line that touches a curve at one and only one point, like this point, while a normal is a line that is perpendicular to that tangent. So if you have the equation of a normal, you can get the equation of a tangent and vice versa. So find the equations of the tangents and normal to this curve. To find the equation of the tangent, because we first of all need the equation of the tangent. So we have y prime. Um, for this curve, y prime will be equal to when you differentiate this curve, you're going to have uh, 2x minus 3. 2x minus 3. And the gradient of the tangents is y prime at x equals 2. So y prime of 2 will be equal to 2 into 2 minus 3. So, therefore, the gradient of the tangents is 1. What would be the gradient of the normal? Gradient of the normal would be equal to minus 1 divided by 1. So, minus 1 divided by the gradient of the tangents, and that's giving us minus 1. Now, the equation of the line is given by y is equal to m into x minus x1 plus y1. Or suppose say y minus y1 is equal to that. You can just write it like this also. So from here, if you look at the tangents, let's start with the tangents, we will have y to be equal to one into x, minus x1, x1 is this value of x, right? Two. 
But how do we get the value of y1? When x is equal to 2 on this curve, what would be the value of y? When x is 2, y will be equal to 2 times 2, 4. 4 plus 2, 6 minus 6, 0. y is 0 now when x equals 2. 2 plus 0. Hmm? So this curve, when x equals to y equals zero, so the equation of the tangent will be y equals x minus two. Therefore, you can get the equation of the normal directly as well. Equation of the normal will just be equal to y equals minus one into x minus two plus zero. So finally, the equation of the normal will just be y equals minus x plus two. So, uh, those are the equations of the tangents and the denominals. Uh, let us take another example on this one. Find the equations of the tangents and normal to this curve. Now this particular curve is the equation of the circle, so you have to be careful with this one. With this equation of the circle, it is going to have two tangents at this point. Let me illustrate this with the curve. So you have x squared plus y squared equals five, right? Let me show you what happens. So you have the equation x squared squared plus y squared cos five. Can you study the equation of a circle? Of course, you can study the equation of a circle, right? Oh my God. So this is the equation of this circle. And at the point where x is equal to one, we are going to have a tangent here. This x equals one, right? We're going to have a tangent here and another tangent that way. So we have a tangent like this, at this point, another tangent. There are two values of x and y equals something else. So if x is equal to one, you have a tangent here, and you equally have another tangent here. But if x equals negative one, you will have a tangent here and have another tangent here. So there will be two equations of normals and tangents. So if this is the tangent, this should be the equation of the normal should be like this, the same here, or these other ones, depending on what we have. All right, let us go back and see what we have there. So find the equation of the normals and tangents to this curve at x equals negative one. Okay, this curve is saying x equals negative one. So let us look for the y dx. So normally, first of all, if x is equal to negative one, what would be the value of y? For y, you will have negative one squared is one plus y squared is equal to five. And from here, it implies that the values of y be equal to two and negative two. So we have two points. Let me call the first one. The point is the point A, when X is negative one, Y is equal to two. And you equally have another point again, B, because one X value corresponds to two X value, Y values. When X is negative one, Y is negative two as we have seen on that curve that I've just drawn. So um, let us now get the equation of the tangents for each of the curves and the normals to each of these curves. So when we differentiate, we'll have two X plus two Y, Y prime is equal to zero. So from here, our Y prime will be equal to 
minus x and y when you simplify. Now, for the first point, let us start the point A. Hmm? Let us look for y prime of negative one. So y prime of negative one will be equal to, when y is equal to negative one, x has two values, right? So we have negative one over, negative, negative one over two is the first value, which is equal to a half. And y prime of negative one, when y is equal to minus two, You still have the same value, right? A half over minus minus one, which is plus one, over minus two now. So this other gradient is negative a half now. When y is equal to minus two. So the equation of the tangents for this first one, when for the points where y is equal to plus two will be given by y is equal to gradient a half into x minus x one, minus minus one is plus one, plus y one, our y one is two. You can simplify this. At the same time, the equation of the normal will be given by, so for this same point, what will be the equation of the normal of this one? Negative one divided by a half is negative two. So the equation will be y is equal to negative two into x plus one plus two. Why for this second line, the second point which has a coordinate minus one minus two, for the tangent, we have y is equal to negative a half into x minus minus one, so x plus one, x plus one plus minus two. So minus two. And the gradient of the normal, we have y to be equal to minus one divided by a half. That's going to give us plus two, right? So give us plus two into x plus one minus two. So these are the equations of the tangents and normals to this curve. Right, I think this is where we have come to the end of this lesson. The remaining exercise should be assignments. So go through, uh, go to the page www.gcmathpanel.blogspot.com and it will take you to GC Math can the panel classes online. You can go to advanced level and search. This lesson is lesson 8B, uh, lesson 8C, part two of lesson 8C. And you get this lesson there. Okay, and... So the remaining things are assignments. You do this one, do number three assignments. And the next thing is a tutorial and then curve sketching. So before the tutorials, before lesson eight, this is a short lesson titled differentiation of inverse trigonometric functions. Differentiation of inverse trigonometric functions. This one is very, very important because when you move to integration, you will need all of that concept. So thank you so much. And don't forget to subscribe. Stay tuned. GCE Math Panel Online. Don't forget to subscribe and share this comment with your friends and visit the blog now, www.jcmathpanelblogspot.com, where you get announcements about our daily classes. Every day, visit the blog, www.jcmathpanelblogspot.com where you get our announcements about classes and the schedules. If there are any adjustments, assignments, and so on, or there's a test or a quiz, you're going to see in that link. Thank you so much, and stay tuned. Bye-bye.